Welcome, Mercy Village Church. You are Mercy Village Church, so welcome. I'm excited to have you with us. We are uh, going to start with some announcements, and we got a bunch because there is a lot going on. So on, and again, all of this is subject to change, and uh, I'm being led in particular by. Uh, Faith and Josh in this, but this is what we're shooting for. All these dates you're about to see is what we're shooting for. If it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Here's the tentative schedule. This Wednesday night, church-wide work night. Some of you will have specific jobs that uh, Faith and Josh have for you. Uh, Others of you are going to help, again, Lord willing, in the creek don't rise, to move some chairs from my house to the space, so they're at least there. We might not be able to set them all out on Wednesday, but hopefully we'll have a space space in the space where we can can put them, so they're out of the way, but they're there, because that's going to be a major job, so hopefully we get that done on Wednesday. There may be a few things from here that we'll be able to move, even though next Sunday is actually our last Sunday here, so there's some things that have to stay. Until next Sunday. So that's this uh, Wednesday. I'm saying 5.30. Some of y'all have been showing up, I mean, at 3.30. Some of y'all have been wandering in and out of there in the morning hours. I'm just so thankful for... And, and again, by the way, and I said this in the video, and it's just true, and Faith and uh, Josh and some of y'all here know it better than I do. Every day's a work day at the new space, so... Uh, but this will be a church-wide uh, huge effort, and, and it will be fun. Even if, again, I, there's some chaos that happens with some of these. They're not always maybe the most organized, and maybe you're there feeling like you don't have an exact job to do. It's just fun to be together and to enjoy uh, one another's company. So as long as you're not getting in anybody's way, uh, come on out and, and be a part of, of that. We'll find something for you to either do or somewhere for you to stand so that uh, you're not in the way. The Barbersville Community Outreach this Saturday. Uh, Jeremiah had to go uh, take care of some stuff with his his family. He's heading this up. Uh, he's gangbusters with that sort of stuff. But it'll be this. I know it's small, especially if you're sitting on this side of the room. This Saturday, October the 30th, and you can come to the Barbersville Senior Center just around the corner from here, next to where the volunteer fire department is, it's the next, right before the new library. It's the last building on the left before the new library that's being built over there. Um, and we'll find something for you to do, or again, you can just be with us. Don't underestimate, you know, the fact that even if you're there and you're worthless to the project, you're still worthy of love and community and relationship, and so we'll still hang out even if we don't have something for you to do. So from noon to to 4 p.m. this coming Saturday, and in particular, if you can be there a little bit before 3, you'll actually get to mingle and help serve some of the folks. So some folks will come in and sit and eat that you'll be able to serve and, and mingle with and talk to. And then others will drive through. So there'll be a team of people that are serving the drive through folks. And there'll be a team of people. Let me know if you can be there so we can kind of plan accordingly. Uh, the other cool thing about this is it's kind of a group project. There's a lot of other churches in the community that will be there. And they might have two three people from, from some different churches. And we'll all serve alongside each other uh, together. Next week is moving day. So bring a truck if you have one. Drive a truck to church on... Sunday morning, we will then say goodbye to this space and say thank you to God for our time that we spent here, and then we're going to get our muscle on. Um, I don't, I haven't thought anything about food yet, but we might, eat, we might do food after this. I don't know. Just stay tuned, please. If you're not on the weekly email or in the band group or the Facebook group, let me know because that's especially over the next six weeks or so, the information is going to keep getting fed out. Things are going to be subject to change. Um, so, But we'll pack up the trucks after and move some stuff to my basement, some of the stuff that we're not going to 
take over there that we might be able to donate to other churches in the future, and then the rest of it will take to the church. And then this is very tentative. And uh, But I would love for us to be able to spend Wednesday, the first Wednesday of November, even if we've still got work to do, maybe the first 20 minutes, we'll see. Now, what I'm saying, I'm getting you ready for just a liquid environment. It could be anything. And I'm hoping we'll at least be able to carve out a little bit of time on Wednesday the 3rd, and everyone's invited, to pray about the space, maybe even walk through it and pray for what God's gonna about what God's gonna do there. Kind of a, a dedication of that space to be a thy kingdom come building instead of an our kingdom come building. And to be for the glory of God and the fame of Jesus. So we're gonna try it, even if we still have a ton of work to do, I'll let go of it if it's if it's enough. But I do think it's an important opportunity for us to, to do that together. So even if it's it's ten minutes, we'll make it happen on the third. And then our first Sunday, November the seventh. Can't wait. It's looking great over there. And uh, it's gonna be a lot of fun. It's also homecoming Sunday, so we'll have a meal to follow. Eat together. Homecoming Sunday. That's like an old country church thing. So we're gonna embrace that tradition. Our first meeting as a church core team was the first Sunday of November. So the first Sunday of November every year, we'll call it Homecoming Sunday. We'll try to you know, potentially have a meal every time. It'll be a special, special Sunday to share together. And then when you're, uh, when you move on to maybe a different place or, you know, 20 years from now, maybe you'll even come back and we'll celebrate together all that God has done. And then starting, uh, I think the Sunday before Thanksgiving, we're going through the Book of Ruth. And I can't wait. It's going to be our Advent series. These journals, they're uh, four bucks a piece, are available up here. These are really cool. Uh, maybe not for the manliest among us, but they've got like little quotes and stuff kind of written into the into the uh, journal here. So you got the scripture on one side, journal on the other. We got stuff up here for Ephesians too, which isn't until 2022. Okay. That's it. That's all the boring stuff. This is the message Bible. Eugene Peterson, who's passed on, uh, theologian, spent uh, years of his life kind of almost a, a read along commentary. It's not a, an exact translation of the of the Bible, but it reads like the Bible, and some of it has his interpretations of certain passages that, that maybe there'd be some disagreement about, but he gets it right. Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. This is how he writes it. Are you tired? Worn out? Burned out on religion? Jesus says, come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and rightly. And so today, Mercy Village Church, we bid you come. If you're joyful, come. If you're tired, come. If you're standing or slumping, come. Chaotic, hopeful, put together, questioning, peaceful, frustrated, come. Let us learn together as the people of God the unforced rhythms of grace and, and rest joyfully assured that Jesus is enough for us today regardless of our circumstances. Father, thank you so much that we can gather in the name of Jesus, gather as free people, Redeemed people. Uh, worthy people because of Jesus. Received people because of Jesus. And even in our tiredness and in our weariness and in our brokenness, you say, come and find rest with me. What, what a beautiful gift. May we embrace that today through singing. Might we embrace that today as we sit under the teaching of the Word. Might we embrace that today as we celebrate communion as our... After this music, as the kids go upstairs and they engage those truths on their level, may their hearts be stirred in the same exact way. 
that it'll just be forever through today and every Sunday and every day of the week that we just love Jesus a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more until we go home and we spend forever with you. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. And will you stand with me? Welcome again, Mercy Village Church. We're going to lift our voices this morning and sing together. First, we're reminded we exist to experience and embody redemption and renewal in Christ alone. So we sing together, redeemed. Let's lift our voices. I will not. 
crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself. <clears throat> oh Lord my God, when I in awesome Consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe is slain. And sings my soul, my Savior God, to me. How great. Virginia, 
at Mercy Village Church, God, and we're excited to see people being stirred up for the gospel, being put in motion, sharing the story with others, God, and it's exciting and it's contagious. So just draw us in today as family and teach us who you are. Teach us more about you today uh, so we can just uh, we can love you uh, deeper and know you fuller today. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, kids, get out of here. <laughs> Thank you so much to our kids ministry volunteers, um, in particular Josh and Faith, who have helped get this thing launched. Can you turn on that back bank of lights, maybe? So people can... I don't know if anybody carries printed Bibles anymore or not, but just in case, that's still a thing. Uh, I'll plug again these guys up here, because, I mean, again, I, I love taking notes, but like, so grab one of these. If you ain't got four bucks, we'll give it to you. We're just trying to, right now, kind of recoup the, the cost of, of what we what we paid for them. But, uh, and then these guys, it's a deep dive into the, the book of Ephesians, which will start in 2022. I think these are 7 or $8. Dollars. But let me know if you want one of those. Just a 12-part study. You can do it with a friend or, or whatever. Um, and then two types of Ephesians journals. There's these, which are fancy. And if you're worried about, like, being hard, uh, you know, like a tough man, you just get the basic one up here. Um, that's cool, too. So. All right, I'm going to read a few verses from our passage today for, as, we, as we begin. Nahum 1, verse 1, an oracle concerning Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, of Elkosh. Chapter 2, verses 10 through 13, desolate. Desolation and ruin, hearts melt and knees tremble. Anguish is in all loins, all faces grow pale. Where is the lion's den, the feeding place of the young lions? Where is the lion and the, uh, where the lion and the lioness went, where his cubs were? With none to disturb, the lion tore enough for his cubs and strangled prey for his lioness. He filled his caves with prey and his dens with torn flesh. Behold, I am against you, declares the Lord of hosts, and I will burn your chariots in smoke. And the sword shall devour your young lions. I will cut off your prey from the earth. And the voice of your messengers shall no longer be heard. <coughs> Chapter 3, verses 5 through 7. It cranks it to 11. Behold, I am against you, declares the Lord of hosts, and will lift up your skirts over your face, and I will make nations look at your nakedness and kingdoms at your shame. I will throw filth at you and treat you with contempt and make you a spectacle, and all who look at you will shrink from you and say, Wasted is Nineveh, who will grieve for her? Where shall I seek comforters for her? And even with brutal passages like that, we all say together, as is written on the screen, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord stands forever. Today, we're going to start a very brief, only two-week series through the book of Nahum, three chapters. I've experienced weddings from multiple points of view. I've been a groom in one, only one. I've been a groomsman in several. I, I, I didn't sit down to count, <coughs> at least half a dozen. And primarily, my, my most intensive experience with weddings is as a photographer and now as an officiant done all those different roles at the at the wedding. Now, what I've learned, in particular in West Virginia, is that there's a few of those roles that you have to have. You don't have to have a photographer to get married. You don't have to have groomsmen to get married. You need two consenting adults now, according to the law, to get married, according to God, uh, two, uh, a male and a, a, a man and wife. 
and you have an officiant, according to the laws of, of West Virginia. That makes me essential, not me personally, but the person who plays the role of officiant essential to the wedding ceremony. You can't have a true wedding without an officiant. You can have a beautiful event, but ultimately it's a beautiful bunch of nothing because without the officiant it can't be sealed. It doesn't have to be a Christian pastor, just somebody who's officially licensed to officiate weddings, but you have to have it, or it doesn't stick, it doesn't stay, it doesn't count. Nahum's going to show us an even more important truth. You can't have the kingdom without the king. You can't have the kingdom without the, without the king. This book of prophecy is to a people who had rejected Yahweh as king. They had a chance. Jonah had rolled out there, proclaimed the gospel to, to them, the truth about God, and they had received it in Nineveh. But over time, they grew apathetic to it. They embraced their false idols. They returned to building their own kingdom their own way. By the way, you can build a kingdom without the king. But you can't build the kingdom without the king. And what we'll see in Nahum is that a kingdom is not the kingdom. And a kingdom will be destroyed, but the kingdom will never be destroyed. The only lasting kingdom that you can build that you can be a part of has to come with the king. Not at all. You can't have the promises of God without God. You can't have the comfort, the easy yoke of Jesus without yoking up with Jesus. You can't have the, the comfort and the guidance of the Holy Spirit without the Holy Spirit. And that might seem obvious, but you can't have the fruit of the kingdom, the justice of the kingdom, the reward of the kingdom of God without the king of kings. We're getting ahead of ourselves. Today, specifically, we'll see this. You can't have the kingdom without a life marked by humility and repentance because they are the king's currency. And King Jesus died so that you might own both of those things. Humility and repentance can be yours, which are the currency of the kingdom today because of, because of Jesus. Father, today what we know not, please teach us. What we are not, please make us. And what we have not, please give us. It's in the beautiful name of, of King Jesus that we pray. Amen. Nahum 1 Verse 1, an oracle concerning Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum of Elkosh. So the first question is, nay what? You like that? It's pretty clever play. Nay what? Like say what? Yeah. I've been inspired by Norm MacDonald to explain my jokes after I tell them in his passage. It's an oracle. An oracle, the, the root of that word is a burden, something heavy that someone has to share. It's specifically a written word. It doesn't have to be vocalized. It can simply just be written as an oracle. An oracle, and in the Bible, almost always an oracle is a prophecy of destruction. And that's what Nahum is, exactly. It is a written word that is heavy, and is a, it is a prophecy of destruction. Nahum may have spoken out loud, he may not have, but we have it in written form. Another thing about this book from a literary standpoint that is uh, kind of important to know, and I know it might be hard to see, but in the Old Testament, which would have been all of the Bible in Jesus' day, the Old Testament would have been read in a different order than it appears in our uh, English translation. Now, that doesn't matter. All the books were the same. All the, it's just they were reordered. And one interesting thing was that the 12 minor prophets, 
Okay, so there's major prophets, minor prophets, basically based on the size of the books that you find. So like Isaiah is a major prophet. That's a lot that he wrote. Jeremiah is a major prophet. Your minor prophets, if you can see that list, are Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah. We were there at the beginning of, of 2021. Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. All the Amish kids were, wrote, are the minor prophets. And those minor prophets appeared in Jesus' day in one scroll called the Book of the Twelve. It would have been read oftentimes in one sitting, all of those minor prophets as one single work, the Book of the Twelve. And that's important because there's a, a theme that transcends it. The first six books highlight the sin of God's people. Like Jonah, for instance, that Israel hated Assyria. That was a sin, right? You see the sin of Nineveh in Jonah, but you also see the sin of Jonah in Jonah. And so those first six minor prophets highlight sin. The next three, punishment. That God punishes sin. And then the last three, that God is a God of restoration. Sin must be punished, but He restores His people. And so as the people of God would have read that, all of them in one sitting, that's how they would have said, we are sinners, woe to us, our God punishes sin, there is, there is fear and reverence that we should have towards Him, but there is hope. Our God is a God of restoration. Nahum comes at the shift from seeing ourselves as sinful people to seeing God as a God who punishes sin. Nahum kicks off that section. So that's, that's uh, the what. The who is Nahum of Elkosh. Uh, he's a, uh, an, an Elkoshite. That's what he would have been called. He's an Elkoshite. So now you know everything you need to know, right? We don't get to meet Nahum anywhere else, but there's some speculation about where he's from. I love this stuff. This is the nerd stuff. We'll be past it here in a second. So uh, there's a place... Just uh, north of uh, Kabul, Iraq, right? You know that, that city, or at least if you are not Kabul, Mosul, Iraq, called Al-Kush. It's no longer called that, but in ancient times it would have been. So you kind of zoom in, kind of see where we're at in Iraq. If you're not familiar with geography and maps, you can see Jerusalem and Israel down here, and then up, right? is uh, Maz, Mazul, I'm probably saying that wrong, in Iraq. And then just north of that would be where people speculate that Nahum was at at the time he wrote this letter. So if you zoom in just a little bit, you can see about a 50-minute drop, right? <laughs> okay. This is interesting to me, geeking out. Here's why it's interesting to me. That's the ancient ruins of Nineveh, right there. That's the city center of Mosul, Iraq. Did you know that? Did you know that? That this is where Nineveh was. It's possible that Nahum writes this in captivity as the people of Israel, the northern kingdom, had already been taken, many of them, into captivity in Assyria. That's one possibility. You know, where's this all speculation? I got more maps, don't worry. <laughs> I didn't know this either. Capernaum, that's the Sea of Galilee. So now you're in Israel. So Sea of Galilee here, Capernaum was a, 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 a town right on the Sea of Galilee. Capernaum means Nahum's town. That's what that means. Nahum's town. Nahum means compassion, so that's rooted in, rooted in that, that uh, name of that town, Capernaum. But it means literally Nahum's town. He might have been from, from there, which would put him in the northern kingdom, who were under the thumb of Assyria, who were being drug out into exile by Assyria. So he's either in exile, he's either still in Israel, but seeing his countrymen drug off into exile, or he's in this little tiny town that I'm not even going to try to pronounce, that's just south of Bethlehem, in the kingdom of Judah, who are living in fear that Assyria is going to take them off into exile. Because all their brothers and sisters in the north are being carted off into exile. So either way, it could be either of those three locations, he feels the weight 
of the Assyrian uh, armies, the weight of the Assyrian government. Okay, enough maps, but i got a timeline for you too, because you got to know when this happens. It matters. The context matters here. We're almost done with, with literature class. Don't worry. Here's Nahum's name up there at the top. You see Jonah all the way back here. And these two green lines represent the two kingdoms of Israel. They started as one. All twelve tribes of Israel were together in one kingdom. King Saul, King David, King Solomon, and then they split. Ten tribes go north, Israel. Two tribes go south, Judah. Two kingdoms, one people. God's people, Israel. Two separate kingdoms. Israel doesn't make it quite as far. Remember the promises uh, of the kingdom went through the line of Judah. David. His people. Those were the promises of the throne of Israel. They get a lot longer run. They have a lot more kings that love God during that run. Israel gets carted out about 722 B.C. Remember everything before Christ counts down. So you're counting down, not up. So it gets confusing. You're going down from 722 to 586. 586 is when Judah goes into exile. 722 is when Israel is scattered into exile. And Nahum comes in the between those two times. Israel's being carted off, the, tri the ten tribes of Israel are being carted off into exile. They're being uh, enslaved by the Assyrians. In Judah, the two tribes in the south are on the verge of this happening to them. And this is where he writes it. Assyria appears unstoppable. Assyria is a force that cannot be beaten. And they are dominating the people of God. And it's from that place that he writes this prophecy. It's a sequel to Jonah. Probably anywhere from 80 to 150, 160 years after Jonah is in Nineveh uh, proclaiming repentance to the people there. And of course we already know the location we just kind of looked at. It. Assyria, the Assyrian kingdom and in particular Nineveh. So it would have been a battle station. This would have been a one of the large Nineveh would have been one of the largest cities in the world at the time, and it was a military town. It was where a lot of their uh, forces, a lot of their uh, military power was was centered. So that's the four one one on the letter. So if you're a if you're a nerd, you enjoyed that. If you not, maybe you're glad it's over. But it matters. Because of the situation that Nahum and the people that he's prophesying to were in. It was not pretty for anyone that he was prophesying to. And everyone there, right, had seen Jonah go to Assyria, and there was mass revival in Nineveh. And maybe, just maybe, the pressure let up for a season. I imagine it did. But now the pressure has returned all the more down on top of them, and they're wondering where the justice is. They're wondering where the righteousness is, where the freedom is, where the, the, the Lord is. And it's into that that Nahum speaks against Nineveh. We're going to do chapters 2 and 3 today and then come back and do chapter 1 next week. And there's a reason for that. I want to end on a hopeful note. And chapters 2 and 3 don't have a whole lot of hope. Chapter 1 has some. We'll see hope in it anyway, because God is, is faithful to us. <clears throat> Verses 3 through 9, chapter 2. The shield of his mighty men is red. This is the destruction of Nineveh. Here it comes. The man that comes in. Hard. <clears throat> the shield of his mighty men is red. His soldiers are clothed in scarlet. This could go either way. That could be how they decorated their armor and their shields, or it could be the blood of those that they're destroying. The Hebrews a little bit could go either way there, but their shields are red, they're clothed in scarlet. The chariots come with flashing metal on the day he musters them. God is the one mustering them, spoiler alert. The cypress spears are brandished. The chariots race madly through the streets. They rush to and fro through the spaces. They gleam like torches. They dart like lightning. He remembers his officers. They stumble as they go. They hasten to the wall. The siege tower is set up. Do you feel the, the, the surging flow of the army, right? It's like a war movie, right? Like an ancient war movie. They're moving towards the wall. They're setting up the towers. 
The river gates are opened, so there's now a breach in it. The palace melts away, just crumbles. Its mistress is stripped. She is carried off, her slave girls lamenting, moaning like doves, and beating their breasts. Nineveh is like a pool whose waters run away. There's a pond down from us, and they pumped it out for some reason over the summer. And every day, it was my, I would get up and look out the window, kind of see how much lower the pond was. But imagine this is more dramatic. Like a pond or a lake or, or, or waters that are held back by a dam that is now crumbled. Halt, halt, they cry, but none turns back. Plunder the silver, plunder the gold. There is no end to the treasure or of the wealth of all precious things, the destruction of Nineveh has commenced. In the prophetic time, not in reality, it'll be 612 B.C., when in reality this actually happens, and it will. I mean, it'll take archaeologists having to recover it for us to ever see this city again. The destruction is coming. This could be anywhere from from 10 to 50 years before that actually happens. But because it's a word from God, it's guaranteed. And it will come true in 612 <laughs> B.C. It goes on. Desolate, desolation and ruin, verse 10 of chapter 2. Hearts melt and knees tremble. Anguish is in all loins. All faces grow pale. This is the, the Ninevites, the people of Nineveh. Where is the lion's den? Not Milton. That's not the answer. Where is the lion's den? The feeding place of the young lions, where the lion and the lioness went, where his cubs were, with none to disturb. The lions tore enough for his cubs and strangled prey for his lioness. He filled his caves with prey and his den with torn flesh. Assyria and Nineveh are the lions. They would go out from their cave and they would destroy the lives of people around them to gain uh, taxes, to gain wealth, to gain resources. And they left a path of destruction, carelessness. They would rip off whatever pound of flesh they wanted, and then they would return to the den. But now, Nahum looks out and he says, where are they? I don't see them. They're not in the den anymore. Where's the lion at? They're, they're fleeing. They're running away. They're, they're being pushed out. Chapter 3, starting in verse 1, Woe to the bloody city all full of lies and plunder, no end to the prey. That, that, that Nineveh would have been the bloody city. Not, that's not British. It was bloody because the men there shed blood over and over and over again. And now it's a bloody city because they're being destroyed by their enemies. A city that was full of lies, deceitful people who would lie to get what they want and plunder people to get what they want. They would just prey on people over and over again. But now the crack of the whip the rumble of the wheel, galloping horse and bounding chariot, horsemen charging, flashing sword and glittering uh, spear, host of slain. This is like the walking dead. Heaps of corpses. Dead bodies without end. This is your Bible. Maybe you can memorize these passages, right? When you need a little pick-me-up. They stumble over the bodies. The enemies, as they take out Nineveh, stumble over over the bodies. Don't worry, it gets better. Here's the reason why. And all for the countless whorings of the prostitute. Graceful and deadly charms who betrays nations with her whorings and peoples with her charms. This city, right? Yahweh came to them through Jonah and he said, I'll be your husband. Repent. Turn to me. Make me the king and I'll give you the kingdom. Make me the king and I'll give you the kingdom. And they repented for a little while. But then they went back, right? As Nahum puts it. Not me. Don't get mad at your pastor for talking like this. They went back to their whoring after other gods. After other things that they put in first place in their lives, they weren't going to submit themselves to the king. They were going to build their own kingdom their own way. Nahum says, are you better than Thebes that sat by the Nile? This is Egypt. 
and the water around her, her rampart a sea, and water her wall. Cush was her strength, Egypt too, and that without limit. You remember how invincible, he's saying to the Assyrians, you remember how invincible Egypt seemed back in the day? And they thought nobody could touch them. They were surrounded by water and walls and had warriors and people doing their bidding. They put, uh, put in Libyans were their helpers. They would come to, to fight with them whenever they needed help. They seemed unstoppable, yet... She became an exile. And you know how the Assyrians would have known that was true? Because they're the ones that did. They're the ones that took them into exile. She, right, Egypt went into captivity. Her in infants were dashed in pieces. How comforting is that? At the head of every street. For her honored men, lots were cast. The best of the best in Egypt became slaves bound in chains. And then he says, you also will be drunk. Egypt became drunken with power. And now Assyria is drunken with their own power. He said, but you'll go into hiding. You will seek refuge from the enemy. All your fortresses are like fig trees. I love this image. With first ripe figs, if shaken, they fall into the mouth of the eater. You think your kingdom is strong, but it's just going to get shaken a little bit and you'll be consumed. Behold, your troops are women in your midst. Not politically correct, right? You can't say that anymore. But I guess back then, right, like you could insult people by calling them a woman. Um, I don't recommend that. But he says it there. The gates of your land are wide open to your enemies. Fire has devoured your bars. Draw water for the siege. Strengthen your forts, go into the clay, tread the mortar, take hold of the brick mold. He says, you better build up your ramparts, build up your fortresses, but it won't matter even if you do. There will the fire devour you, the sword will cut you off, it will devour you like locusts. Multiply yourself, he said. Get bigger armies. Get more warriors. Institute the draft. Bring everybody in. Multiply like the grasshopper. You increased your merchants that way, right? You've gotten comfortable, and now you're like building your economy. Build back up your army, it won't matter. More than the stars of the heavens, the locust spreads its wings and, and flies away. He says, your princes are like grasshoppers. Your scribes like clouds of locusts. Settling on the fences in the day of cold, right? When everything's nice and calm and peaceful. But when it gets hot... When the sun rises, your leaders will flee. They'll fly away when times get tough and no one will know where they are. Your shepherds, the people who guide you, they're asleep. O king of Syria, your nobles slumber. Your people are scattered on the mountains with none to gather them. There is no easing your hurt. Your wound is grievous. All who hear the news about you clap their hands over you. For upon whom has not come your unceasing evil? says the world's going to rejoice in your end. They will stand in applause when you're done because nobody in this region has been untouched by your evil ways and they will rejoice over your death. That will be the end for Nineveh. That's brutal, man. But why? Why would God do that to them? Well, that's a good question. First of all, we know it is God. Because in verse 13 it says, Behold, I am against you, declares the Lord. It's the Lord that's bringing this destruction against them. The Lord of hosts. The King of kings. I will burn your chariots in smoke, and the sword shall devour your young lions. I will cut off your prey from the earth, and the voice of your messengers shall no longer be heard. Verse 5 of chapter 3, Behold, I am against you, declares the Lord of hosts. It's God who's coming against them. And I will lift up your skirts over your face, and I will make nations look at your nakedness and the kingdoms at your shame. I will throw filth at you. That's, that's like sounds like a monk, like monkeys, right? Tossing their crap at each other. But that also, this is a great picture. That word in Hebrew, this is cool. Maybe not to anybody else. It can be for anything that God detests. What does God detest the most if you read the Old Testament? Idolatry. In my mind, I imagine this image of the Ninevites being pelted to death by their own idols. 
their own false gods that they worship. And then I have to think to myself, if I was there, what would I get pelted to death with? Would it be my phone, right? Because I've idolized maybe a bunch of iPhones just like pelting me to death. Right? Do you see? I mean, do you see why that's that's one of the images of that word? Maybe a bunch of you know sports equipment just like knocking me into the ground. You know what? I mean, I will throw filth at you and treat you with contempt, make you a spectacle, and all who look at you will shrink from you and say, "Wasted is Nineveh. Who will grieve for her? Where shall I seek comforters for you?" But here's the why. That's the who behind the destruction. It's God. Here's the why. The scatterer has come up against you. Man the ramparts. Watch the road. Dress for battle. Collect all your strength. Here's why. God's not just destroying something. He's upholding something. For the Lord is restoring the majesty of Jacob as the majesty of Israel. For plunderers have plundered them and ruined their branches, but God will bring them back. Here's the point. God is for God. What I mean by that is God desires His own glory. And He's not a narcissist to do that because in His glory is found the deepest joy of His children. None of us can say that. You desire your own glory. That will come with selfishness. That will come with harm to others. But when God desires His own glory, it is for the good of His children. You see, God is for God. And because God is for God, God is for all those to whom He is now the people of Israel they've gone through punishment they've gone through exile they still have exile to come we as the children of God will fail him will mess up we're not going to be perfect people but he still loves his kids and he comes to fight for them against the Assyrians God fights for those to whom he is king and on the flip side he fights against all those to whom he is not king. They may have a season where their kingdoms live and thrive, but, but not forever. You see, the Assyrians built a kingdom, a kingdom. But they couldn't build the kingdom. They built a pretty massive kingdom. It wasn't the kingdom. We live in a world that longs for justice. It doesn't want anything to do with the justified. We live in a world that longs for peace, but doesn't want anything to do with the Prince of Peace. We live in a world that longs for love, but not the God who is love. You can't have the kingdom without the king. We live in a world that longs for pathways and answers and, and full lives, but they want nothing to do with the way, the truth, and the life. They want equality without the reconciler. Comfort, but not the comforter. Guidance, but not the shepherd. A beautiful kingdom, but not the, the king of kings. The world around us is building their kingdoms without the king. And if we're not careful, we'll <clears throat> fall into the exact same trend. We'll take the thy and thy kingdom come and turn it into my, my kingdom come. We would never say it. That's heretical. We wouldn't say it out loud. None of us would stand up here and pray, Dear Lord, my kingdom come. But we'll live as if that's true. We, me, just this week, I did that. Multiple times I found myself falling into the place where I desired my kingdom, not God's kingdom. We'll fall into a desire to see the kingdom come for ourselves. But there's hope between the lines of Nahum. You've got to rewind a little bit. Maybe 80, maybe 120, maybe 160 years. And you see Jonah, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. And Jonah says, Nope, I ain't doing it. And he flees. 
But God in His relentless mercy tracks him down and by chapter 3 He's restored him as His prophet and He says, the Lord has came to Jonah the second time saying, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breath, and Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And watch what happened. The people of Nineveh believed God. They said, you will be our king. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. The fact that you're here today, the fact that I'm here today, testifies to the fact that God is a God of mercy. God is a God of patience. Nahum testifies to the fact that he won't be patient forever. But Jonah testifies to the fact that he gives mercy and patience for hundreds of years to the vilest of people, including me. He waited for me. He chased after me. He waited for you. He chased after you. That's the beauty of who our God is. Maybe you're not in a relationship with God. The fact that you're here is testament to 2 Peter 3.19. The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promises. Some count slowness, but he is patient towards you. Not wishing that any should perish like Nineveh, but that all should reach repentance. God desires for you to make him the king of your life today. And he made a way for you to take ownership of the repentance and humility that is the currency of the kingdom. Those won't come from within yourself. They were bought for you by Jesus, in the most surprising way, Jesus drank the cup of God's wrath. You remember the flashing metal and the cypress spears? We read it fast. Chapter 2, verse 3. The gleam of the torches in verse 4. Did anybody think of the Garden of Gethsemane? Gleaming torches. Flashing metal. Spears that would eventually be driven into the side of Jesus as they came to arrest him. Remember the stripped mistress of, of chapter 2, verse 7? You see Jesus stripped naked before the world, hanging on the cross in humility and shame. Remember the plundering of chapter 2, verse 9, and then you see the soldiers casting lots for the only possession he has, his garment, plundering all that he has. Remember the desolation of chapter 2, verse 10? See Jesus on the cross alone. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Remember the destruction of the lion? Chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. Jesus, the lion of Judah, will be destroyed on the cross so that your sins can be forgiven. It's all about Jesus. You don't have to look very hard to see Him. Remember the blood flowing through the city of Nineveh in chapter 3, verse 1? Jesus will spill out His blood and the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. Remember the grievous wounds? Chapter 3, verse 19. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed, this is Jesus, for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one of us to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And he took our sin to the cross, and there he was wounded for our transgressions, and by his wounds we find healing. Forgiveness for our sins. But unlike Nineveh, Jesus didn't deserve it. Nineveh did. Jesus did. Jesus was God's perfect son. Perfect in every single way, without sin, and yet he took the punishment there. Unlike Nineveh, Jesus' destruction was not eternal. Nineveh is just a relic now. They rebuilt a little bit of it so you can go and tour it, but the city's gone, done. Jesus was gone for about three days. And then he raised to life and power. With the keys to death and hell in the grave in his hand. And unlike Nineveh, Jesus 
death, and resurrection brought life. Verse 11 of Isaiah 53. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. You can be made right with God today. If you're a Christian, you have been made right with God today because he drank all the wrath of God against sin on your behalf. What a Savior. Because he bore our iniquities. If you're not a Christian, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ today and be saved. Trust Jesus today. If you are a Christian, the question we close with is, how did we get from Jonah 3.10? When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways in Nineveh in Jonah's day, God relented of the disaster, and He said uh, that He had said He would do to them and did not do it to Naaman 3.7. And all who look on you will shrink back and say, wasted is Nineveh. Who will grieve for her? Where shall I seek comforters for you? The question you need to ask yourself today is how do you get from Jonah in 80 years, 120 years, 160 years to Nahum? How do you get there? Stop repenting. That's how you get there. Stop fostering humility. That's how you get there. You want to see generational fade away from God? Stop repenting. You want to see yourself fade into a place where you seek your own kingdom and not God's kingdom? Stop repenting. Stop fostering humility. Man, repentance gets a bad rap, right? We, we feel like that's like this harsh thing, like repent, because we've heard those crazy preachers, repent or die, repent or burn, you know? Like that's kind of how we like, we. but repentance, repentance does include that, right? It does include a piece where we're like, Man, without Jesus, I am done for. I must repent of my sins. It does. It does have that fear part to it. It has that wrath part to it. But it's so much more. Repentance is a day-by-day -day faith in the promises of God. That His ways are higher than your ways. That His dreams are better than your dreams. That His promises are better than my ability to do anything. That everything He does and says and represents and calls us to is better than anything in me. That's repentance as a daily posture of saying, I can't. My ways are not high, but yours are Jesus. I submit myself to you. It's praying, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. As a regular practice in our lives, it's yoking up with your big brother Jesus. In a posture of repentance, saying, my yoke, my kingdom is going the same way none of us does to destruction, but the yoke of Jesus is light. The yoke of Jesus, there is rest for my soul. But to get there, we can't be too good for sackcloth and ashes. We have to foster humility in our lives. We have to see ourselves for who we really are. And the best way for you to see yourself as you really are is to look at Jesus. See Him for who He is. See the perfection of his life, the generosity of his incarnation, the cost of his sacrifice, the power of his resurrection, the depth of his love. And as you see him, you will see who you really are. We're none of those things. But he is all of those things. So if I leave you with anything today, it's this. Fix your eyes on Jesus. And if you do that... If you look to Him through the disciplines of prayer and reading the Bible and gathering corporately and you behold Jesus regularly, consistently, humility will flow down like water in your life. There's no choice but for you to become more humble. And then repentance will spring up like perennial flowers. Those are flowers that bloom over and over and over again. As your big brother Jesus says, come to me humble. Come to me repenting and take my yoke and I will give you rest. Repentance is resting. If I could change your mind, if you, if you still have bad connotations with repentance, and I could change your mind on anything today, it would be that. Repentance is resting. Humility is taking up the yoke of Jesus, which is the light. 
So repent regularly, foster humility. You can't have the kingdom without a life marked by humility and repentance because they are the king's currency. And King Jesus dies so that you might own them both. And in owning them beside him, yoked up with him, find rest for your souls. Father, that's a lot. You're good. I'm not. You are. That's a lot. There's a lot there. It's like drinking from a fire hose. But you have the power to apply that to every individual life in this room. So I pray that you will in the way that you see fit. You'll do what I can't do. You'll heal your people. You'll encourage your people. You'll exhort your people. You'll comfort your people. You'll call your people to repentance. You'll call your people to humility. Your people. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Celebrate communion quickly together. Just a reminder, again, of Jesus taking on the wrath of the Father so that we might be children of God. We might have peace. We might avoid that wrath. As they were eating, He took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body. And He took a cup and when He had given thanks, He gave it to them. And they all drank of it. And He said to them, This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Father, may we not glaze past these elements as we behold you and your, your sacrifice, Jesus. May our hearts be filled with humility that flows down and leads us to repentance daily, ongoing, submitting ourselves to the kingdom way, submitting ourselves to the way, the truth, and the life that is you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray to our Father. Amen. Close with these, this benediction. Well, it's not up here. Let's read it. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.